Contested Bones, part 18. We've been going through the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, there's more information on the book available at contestedbones.org. Uh, the cover looks like that. The two authors, Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, <coughs> the prologue explains why the book was written in the first place. John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50, when he realized that first, evolution couldn't do what it was advertised to do. And secondly, he realized that evolution was fighting against a far more powerful force called genetic entropy, which you might call devolution. Concluded that not only was evolution wrong, but the age that evolution depended on was in all probability wrong too. And then he had cognitive dissonance with what he called all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes that he had been taught. And so he and Chris Roop set out to investigate, and the results of their investigation is the book. Chapter one lays some uh, groundwork, discusses the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles. Chapter two, the textbook picture following Darwin, Darwin's expectation is straight line evolution. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like, and we're gonna go over that fairly shortly. Some state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. These are people who believe that there was an ascent of man. It's just, it's too confusing. Almost all the fossils are contested. Chapter three makes a good argument that Neanderthals are human. Chapter four, that Homo erectus is human. Chapter five, that Homo floresiensis is human. Chapter six argues that Australopithecus afarensis is simply an ape. Chapter seven argues that Ardipithecus rambidus is an ape. Chapter eight argues that Homo habilis is in fact not a real creature, but a mixture of ape and human bones. Chapter nine argues the same for Australopithecus sediba, which the fact that Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus naledi are being offered tells you that these science is not settled. Chapter 10 shows the, that Homo naledi, I think uh, uh, it argues that Homo naledi is human and I think does a good job of arguing. Chapter 11 notes that modern humans lived alongside of apes and going back to 5.7 million years ago by conventional dating, which means modern humans could not have evolved from apes unless the evolution took place far beyond what everybody has claimed uh, in terms of time. Um, chapter 12 argues that conventional dating is flawed. Potassium argon and argon dating have trouble identifying recent lava, dating it too old quite often, as does uranium thorium dating, and carbon-14 dating actually argues for a young age for life on Earth even when dating methods agree, a whole bunch of them, they're not secure. Chapter 13 uh, states that genetic arguments against a Darwinist explanation or any other process that does not incorporate intelligence for a transition from apes to man are really very strong and genetic arguments for such an, a transition are weak to non-existent. And uh, last week, we, or two weeks ago, I guess, we saw the disappearance of the argument for the uh, chromosome two being a fusion of two ape chromosomes. And in chapter 13, they give what they call a simpler model. And, uh, the subtitle is Validation of the Ape to Man Story. And uh, Leslie Aiello states, no doubt about it, Australopithecines are like apes and the homo group are like humans. He starts out, or the book, the chapter starts out so many problems. 
in the latter part of the 20th century, the paleo community had constructed a simplistic, linear view of human evolution. It was thought that one hominin species evolved cleanly into the next, and the next reminiscent of the iconic a parade visual. They thought everything worked according to plan. Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis, was envisioned to evolve into Habilis, which evolved into Erectus, which finally evolved into Homo sapiens. Ernst Meyer championed this so-called straight-line view of human evolution in the 50s and 60s. During this earlier era, taxonomic diversity was assumed to be very limited, with each hominin species occupying its own discrete place in time, and the whole thing going up as a unified um, uh, population uh, set. In recent decades, however, the paleo community has universally abandoned Meyer's straight line view of human evolution. The paleo community now describes the hominin fossil record as a messy, tangled bush. In science, uh, Schwartz and Tattersall note, in contrast to Meyer's austere linearity, we may, know, we may find, I'm sorry, that I missed another mutation there, that human evolution rivaled that of other mammals in its evolutionary experimentation and diversity. In the journal Nature, Aiello and Collard, Aiello being the person we quoted earlier, described the time period before Erectus saying, evolutionary history now looks more like a tangled bush than a simple tree. Paleo experts now claim they also see the same pattern of diversity higher up in the tree within the genus Homo. Neanderthals, Denisovans, Erectus, Hobbit, Naledi, and anatomically modern humans all coexisted. As Lee Berger and College write in the eLife Journal, as others have noted, <coughs> Stringer 2016 noticed that he's quoting somebody else too. The fossil hominin record of the middle and late Pleistocene show shows no simple linear progression toward modern humans and different morphological forms overlapped in time. What that means is that the stuff you were taught and a few of you taught um, about one semi-species following another in a simple linear progression that was just flat out wrong. That's not according to me, that's according to Lee Berger and quoting Stringer. Meredith Small from Cornell University says, for anthropology students 30 years ago, learning human evolution was a breeze. It went from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to various Homo sapiens. It was a straight shot that one could learn in a few minutes late at night while cramming for an exam. <coughs> but in the late 1970s, we entered a golden age of human fossil discoveries that has repeatedly punched holes in the naive idea that our evolution would be that clear, clean, and straight. Like most animals, continuing this quote, like most animals, humans have a checkered past, and our family album is now full of side branches and dead ends. The straight line has blossomed into a spreading, rather uncontrolled bush, and we don't like it. Is science about liking? We want our history to be nice and neat, but the fossils keep messing us up. We want the last 200,000 years of human evolution, the time when modern Homo sapiens appeared to make some kind of sense, but it doesn't. From the paleo community's perspective, this newfound diversity has totally obscured the fossil tree, uh, trail leading to man. They freely confess that no part of the hominin bush reveals an ape-to-man progression with one hominin species evolving into the other. Is the fossil trail to man lost? Or did it ever really exist? Johannes Heil Selassie laments that the hominin fossil record is becoming increasingly confused, confusing with every new discovery. In the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, he asked in the title of his paper, Do More Fossils mean less clarity. He answers his own question by confessing that every new hominin discovery is further complicating our understanding of human evolution. 
Paleo expert Susan Anton of New York University has come to the same conclusion. All new discoveries make things more confusing. Donald Johansson agrees. The transition to HOMO continues to be almost totally confusing. Well, except that uh, um, Lucy belongs there. Uh, paleo expert John Hawks notes, what a mess early HOMO is. Wood writes, even with all the fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of HOMO remains elusive. How many of you were taught that in your early classes? How many of you read that as you went through museums? In 1992, Bernard Wood in Nature said, it is remarkable that the taxonomy and phylogenetic relationships of the earliest known representatives of our own genus Homo remain obscure. Reassessments of the fossils themselves have rendered untenable a simple unilineal model of human evolution in which Homo habilis succeeded the Australopithecines and then evolved via Homo erectus into Homo sapiens. But no clear alternative consensus has yet emerged. Not only is the old story gone to the people who really know, but they don't have a replacement. Now, that was his opinion 25 years uh, uh, before. In 2014, 25 years later, Wood reaffirmed his early assessment. In his view, hominin evolution has become even more uncertain than ever. In 2014, he provided an updated tree diagram in an article published in Scientific American, which we will see next. It is shown as a complex bush with many twisted, broken, and disconnected branches. And Wood is going to say something, but before we have him say what he wants to say, we're going to look at the figure that was drawn with his advice. And you will notice that there are very few branches that are actually are attached to each other. I guess this one is felt attached. The Homo ergaster and Homo erectus are felt to be pretty much the same. Um, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals just felt to be pretty much the same. And in fact, because these two can interbreed, I, that's probably reasonable. But you notice that he can't attach anything to anything. Now, here's another one that maybe belongs. But you can see it's all disconnected. Wood acknowledges his, what he's going to say. Genetic and fossil evidence shows closely related hominin species shared the planet many times in the past few million years, making it more difficult to identify direct ancestors of modern humans than scientists anticipated even 20 years ago when he was making his other statement. Skipping on to some more of the same general kinds of stuff, we're going to get to what they label all our, our alternative model. In the light of the current confusion within this field, we humbly put forward an alternative scientific model. We confess we are coming at this from the outside the field, but we have invested several years in the study of this subject. Minimally, we have earned the right to question the paradigm, to critically examine the consensus view, and to consider alternative models. We have dared to do all this research because we realize the great importance of this question. Where did we come from? We feel we have the answer to the persistent question, why can't the various hominin species be arranged into a coherent ape to man progression? We propose it is simply because man did not evolve from any Australopithecine ape or any other type of ape. Since the time of Darwin, Paleoanthropologists have obsessively been trying to force the fossil record into an ape to man progression. All they have found is an incoherent, tangled, disjointed, messy bush. When the fossil evidence is taken at face value, when the bones are not forced into an ape to man framework, 
the bush suddenly becomes cleaner and untangled, consisting of a series of individual branching trees. Figure four, and we're going to look at figure four in just a minute. Wood recently described it very sim similarly as a bundle of twigs, which suggests that each species lives side by side with no common ancestor. Bundle of twigs does not have a root. Now, I think there is a mistake in the reason why is here is four. And it doesn't really look like it answers the uh, question, although it's of interest that um, there is a marked decrease in uh, genetic diversity. Um, it depends on who you're listening to. There's some people who will say it was in the neighborhood of 10,000 years ago, which is uh, an interesting conclusion, shall we say. But I think this is figure three is the one that they meant to reference. And there you can see the humans with the various branches of humans and the uh, various branches of uh, apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, and australopithecines. It's of interest that the Bornean and Sumatran orangutan are felt by this particular picture to be the same species and the bonobo and the chimpanzee are felt to be the same species. It would be interesting to compare Y chromosomes in these two sets and see how far apart they are. Or uh, maybe even uh, do uh, uh, mitochondria barcodes to borrow from two weeks from today. This seems to be most consistent with the actual fossil evidence, as some paleo experts are starting to admit. With that in mind, we encourage our readers to explore with us an alternative scientific model that we contend better explains the hominin fossil record. Our model should come as no surprise to any careful reader of the pre previous chapters. We propose that the two basic hominin genera, uh, Australopithecus apes, and homo, humans, do not have an ancestor-descendant relationship. They are simply independent forms of life. Remarkably, whenever well-preserved and nearly complete hominin skeletons are found, they can readily be identified as belonging to one or the other genus. They are either Australopithecus or homo. There is only confusion when the data is incomplete, and maybe when uh, there's mixing up of the various bones. For example, the various fragmentary erectus skulls, most of which are distorted, crushed, and broken, have been difficult to classify. However, as soon as the first, and only, nearly complete erectus skeleton was discovered, that was Turcanaboy in chapter four, the paleo community easily agreed on its distinctly human anatomy. We do not think it is a coincidence that the most fragmentary skeletons, for example, habilis, are the specimens that paleo experts have promoted as the bridge species between the Australopithecus and the Homo genera. I might add that the ones wh where there are missing pieces, the missing pieces are assumed to be closer to humans in uh, Australopithecus and Ardipithecus. However, when there are nearly complete skeletons, there is no ambiguity. The bones can readily be identified as either Australopithecus or Homo. Australopithecus bones, clearly apes. I'm going to skip one paragraph. Two types of evidence were used to argue that the Australopithecus, Australopiths were more than apes. First, certain isolated bones were incorrectly assigned to the Australopiths, which were actually human bones. Second, certain artifacts, for example, fossilized footprint stone tools and butchered bones, had been incorrectly assigned to the Australopiths, which were actually of human origin. See chapter 6 on afferences, chapter 8 on habilis, and chapter 11 on coexistence. Homo bones are clearly human. The term homo simply means human. Today, humans come in many si shapes and sizes. For example, there are people who have different shaped skulls and different shaped faces. There are people who are robust and heavy boned, and people who are gracile and light boned. 
there are people who are very tall and people who are very short. Figure two. And uh, if you're interested in scale, this gentleman is eight feet, six inches tall. This gentleman is two feet something. Um, somebody like me would come up to the, about here on this guy. There are people who have large cranial capacities, large brains, and people who have very small cranial capacities, tiny brains. Humans are wonderfully diverse. For example, North American Indians who lived just 1,000 years ago had very unique skeletal features as do the pygmies of Central Africa and the indigenous Aleutians of Alaska. Yet despite all this skeletal diversity, we are still all one species. The same is true for uh, people groups which have disappeared, such as Neanderthals, Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi. Each type has certain unique features that they all displayed in overall modern human anatomy. They looked like us, walked on two feet like us, and clearly thought like us. Their technologies and cultures demonstrate that they were intelligent and fully human. See the section one chapters and, f and the chapter on Naledi. Um, According to conventional dating methods, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi all coexisted. Again, see chapter 11, where genomic analysis have been possible, in particular with the Neanderthals, they indicate that all the human people groups interbred. We conclude that there is and always has been just one human species, Homo sapiens. Excluding the false taxon habilis, which is a mixture of human and ape bones, according to them, all major homo classifications, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Erectus, Hobbit, and modern man, should be lumped together. We are all members of one beautifully diverse human family. <coughs> primitive features does not mean less evolved. The young dates that have just been assigned to the primitive looking Naledi homo, homo variant confirms it existed with anatomically modern Homo sapiens. This has important ramifications for the popularized ape to man story. Students and the public are taught from an early age that primitive traits mean primitive origins. And in fact, that's been felt since way back. For instance, the discovery of the non-mineralized, which means not very old, um, Neanderthal skull cap in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1856 evolved, evoked a deep sense of the great antiquity of man to its onlookers. If you're prepared for that, that's what you see. The primitive features such as heavy brow ridges and a low sloping forehead had convinced casual observers and early anatomists alike that Neanderthals must have been an evolutionary precursor to man, as had been taught since, until recent decades. <coughs> Thus, it was assumed on the basis of appearance alone that Neanderthals must predate the origin of Homo sapiens. Again, this is assumed simply because we've been taught to believe that prominent brow ridges, elongated skulls, reduced chins, etc., suggest primitive origins, a less evolved state. Yet we are now finding more and more examples of primitive erectus-like bones and skulls that overlap in time with anatomically modern humans. Now, with Naledi, paleo experts like Bernard Wood warn that primitive looking traits may be misleading. Naledi was just assigned a young age, roughly 300,000 years old. Uh, yet it displays archaic features such as pronounced brow ridges, a tiny brain case, forward projecting jaw, and other features ordinarily regarded as subhuman. Berger et al. explained that the existence of a relatively primitive species like Homo naledi, living this recently in southern Africa, is at odds with previous thinking about human evolution. Indeed, all other members of our family tree known from the same time had large brains and were relatively much more evolved than our mo most ancient uh, relatives. H however, Berger et al. argued that we have only an incomplete picture of our evolutionary past and suggest that old fossils might have been assigned to the wrong species or time period. Now notice, this is not actually their comments. This is somebody else, um, namely, Bernard Wood. 
The discovery of Naledi clearly shows that pr primitive characteristics do not mean prim primitive evolutionary origins. Instead, it suggests an entirely different hypothesis. Perhaps archaic looking traits can arise in modern Homo sapiens populations through the influence of other factors that have nothing to do with an evolution from an ape-like ancestor. It does not appear to be a coincidence that all the variant homotypes are described as living in extreme isolation with limited or no gene exchange with other human populations. So-called primitive humans are inbred subpopulations. Unfortunately, some of our human diversity arises from pathology. This is true in the present and this was true in the past. There are aging people, there are people with disease, and there are people born with defects. That is sad, but true. Geneticists now know that the human race is accumulating harmful mutations at an alarming rate and is genetically degenerating. See chapter 13. This degenerative process accelerates whenever a small population is reproductively isolated for many generations. This results in inbreeding and accelerated mutation accumulation. Furthermore, when just a few closely related individuals start a new and isolated population, the result will be founder effects, whereby their descendants will manifest the genetic peculiarities and the defects of the founding individuals. We propose that founder effects, inbreeding, and genetic degeneration gave rise to the anomalous populations we now call Neanderthals, Erectus, Hobbit, and Naledi. Interestingly, these populations are now being described by paleo experts as living in isolation and being inbred. Neanderthals lived in the harsh climate of glacial Europe where only a very sparse population could survive by hunting. Naledi lived among the caves of the South African wilderness. Hobbit lived on the remote Indonesian island of Flores. Each of these settings would lead to founder effects, isolation, and inbreeding. These things would lead to genetic pathologies and anomalous skulls. All of these Homo sapiens populations lived in small tribes and they were probably all inbred. This would lead to many deleterious, I'm sorry, uh, mutations arising and becoming fixed in the population. Four recent papers support our model of inbreeding and degeneration. The first paper reported an analysis of a complete genome sequence of a Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains of southern Siberia and was published in Nature in 2014. The researchers cite evidence that Neanderthals were highly inbred, and their summary statement is, we present a high quality genome sequence of a Neanderthal woman from Siberia. We show that her parents were related at the level of half siblings. That doesn't mean they were half siblings, it means that, that they had that, that much in common in terms of their, um, uh, and that mating among close relatives was common among her recent ancestors. That's beyond the half siblings, that there's evidence that, that there was more than just that. In the second paper, researchers report in a study also published in Nature in 2014, providing evidence of decreased fertility among Neanderthal males. They also reported that modern humans with genes of Neanderthal origin were more likely to have diseases such as lupus, Crohn's disease, and type 2 diabetes. In the third paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Robux and the Soresi cite other findings that indicate Neanderthals had limited genetic variation. They say that Neanderthals also had small effective population sizes and were inbred and that they were thin on the ground, which means living in small tribes that were widely dispersed, as expected for a cold adapted nomadic people group. In the fourth paper published by the Genetics Society of America in the journal Genetics, researchers observed that Neanderthals and Denisovans were inbred with low genetic variation and a high mutational load. High mutation load means that many deleterious mutations had accumulated in their genomes. They write, Neanderthals had at least 40% lower fitness than humans on average. That's quite a drop. These new genetic findings strongly support our model of degeneration of small subpopulations. We had already come to this conclusion even before these new papers were published. We further agree 
with those who observed that Erectus is essentially a variant of Neanderthal except for a generally smaller body size, reduced brain volume, and more severely sloping forehead. It is now recognized that small isolated populations with severely restricted diets are subject to selective reduction in body and brain size due to the advantages of having a reduced caloric requirement. We propose that the erectus population was essentially the same as Neanderthal, but in a more advanced pathologic state, with a reductive adaptation involving reduced brain volume. We agree with Tim White and other paleo experts that Naledi is simply a variant of erectus, but in a more advanced state of degeneration. See chapter 4, and um, I think chapter 9 as well, um, or 10. Um, we also agree that we, we also agree with the paleo experts who argue that Hobbit was a modern human pygmy with re reduced brain and body size caused by inbreeding, island dwarf dwarfism, and reductive selection. Note that there are people there who live with uh, reductive body size. Um, genetic degeneration appears to be a very plausible explanation. Inbreeding is increasingly being acknowledged by several paleo experts. For example, Lee Berger attributed the primitive features seen in the bones of a less than 3,000 year old small body population of Homo sapiens from Palau, that's a Pacific Island, um, to founder effects, genetic isolation, and high inbreeding coefficient. Richard Potts of the Smithsonian Museum also attributes the development of primitive traits seen in Naledi and Hobbit to living in, in extreme isolation. He explains such traits can arise rapidly in those conditions. And this is again quoting somebody else. Island habitats can occur on continents too in small environmental refuges that are sustained long term. Yes, on continents it's typically lizards, butterflies, fish, and small mammals that are susceptible to separation and isolated evolution, and the effects of that isolation can arise rapidly. To me, Naledi and Floresiensis are nature's experiments of isolated evolution in two of our evolutionary cousins. <coughs> Notice this is an evolutionist. But he, he calls this isolated Paleo experts sometimes call this isolated evolution, but what they're essentially describing is a type of genetic degeneration caused by inbreeding, accelerated mutation accumulation, and reductive selection. This is not the kind of process that can genetically transform Australopiths into man. See chapter 13. All of the reputed homo species that are assumed to have been almost human or evolutionary precursors to man appear to simply be aberrant modern humans that lived in isolation. Muddle in the middle, bones, all muddle, no middle. The paleo community describes the crucial transition from Australopith to man as the muddle in the middle or the murky period. Um, certainly doesn't look like the, uh, the icon that you see with the apes gradually morphing into humans. Because there is so little re real evidence of any transition, Berger's recent discoveries, Sidiba in 2008 and Naledi in 2013, were the latest attempts to fill the gap. And the reason they were attempts to fill the gap is because there is a gap. These new bones had seemed to provide candidate ancestors that might bridge the vast gulf between man and ape. However, it appears that most of the paleo community has now rejected Berger's findings for two reasons. One, they are not the appropriate age for a bridge species, both are too young, and two, they don't have the appropriate anatomy for a bridge species. Sediba is far too ape-like most of the time, and Naledi is far too human-like. Paleo experts now suggest that Sediba is a chimera, consisting, now notice they're, they're prefacing this with paleo experts now, rather than we think. So they do think, but they have plenty of company in their thinking. Paleo experts now suggest that Sediba is a chimera, 
consisting of Australopithecus and human bones, and has gone the way of Habilis as a wastebasket species. See chapter 9 on Sediba. And so the vast gulf remains. We see a lot of muddle, but we see no middle. This supports our alternative model, which proposes that there is no bridge species between Australopithecus and Homo. See the section 3 chapters. Now, I'm going to stop there because it's a convenient stopping place. And uh, we will conclude the last part of the chapter and chapter 15, which is a very short chapter, uh, uh, next week. My, my take on this particular part is that the model that Roop and Sanford propose is not the only model that is compatible with short age creationism. It is indeed possible that there could be ape human intermediates compatible with a short time frame. Um, there could be gross genetic engineering, and by th that I mean not only that it is uh, uh, not very specific, it doesn't take much in equipment, um, but also that it is gross. Um, humans mating with chimpanzees or gorillas or something else. Um, but there could also have been specific genetic engineering. We need to be careful not to underestimate the intelligence of the people who lived before the flood. However, the evidence that they review seems to support the position they take. Um, and so even though it, I don't have a totally firm theory that says it can't possibly be correct, I think that they do make a reasonable case that the evidence supports their position. That position, of course, is incompatible with the standard evolutionary model. But the standard evolutionary model is incompatible with any plausible creation of the required genetic information, as they point out in chapter 13, uh, let alone with genetic entropy and it is effectively dead. And I might point out also that it's really incompatible with um, the obvious implications of the carbon-14 data that we have. Uh, we need to be careful not to twist the evidence or force it into a predetermined theory, and that's one reason why I want to keep those other options open. But, uh, and, and, and I think that, uh, that uh, Enthusiastic evolutionists tend to try to glom on to a nice theory that they can promote. Um, and that's what, of course, caused the uh, ape to man uh, controversy. But it seems to me that Roop and Sanford have largely, if not completely, avoided that trap. The claim is often made that we creationists are forcing the data to fit with our theory. Um, that is why the first 11 chapters are so important. You have to see the data before you realize that it does actually fit the theory that they're presenting. The fact is that this claim is a good example of projection. Enthusiastic evolutionists too often force the data to fit their theory. And you can see this evident in the desperate attempts to make Lucy into a ape human intermediate when we now have data that looks like uh, it's totally irrelevant because uh, we have humans to go back by conventional dating 5.7 million years. Their colleagues often agree with us on the evidence itself, the enthusiastic evolutionist colleagues, even while disagreeing on the interpretation of that evidence. In other words, what Roop and Sanford have done is not crazy. The people who actually look at the data agree with them on major uh, elements of their outline. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Paul? Yes. Uh, uh, this, of course, uh, brings me back to uh, the meetings we had in St. George uh, about four years ago, five years ago. Uh, 
uh, or Lee Spencer had uh, yes a tremendous I don't know what he had about 20 different yeah uh, skulls there uh, that followed a continuous line mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course he implied uh, uh, that there was uh, inbreeding between the lower ones and the higher ones. And, yes. Uh, and of course, it fits with Ellen White's statements to that effect. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, which which is an ambiguous statement can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. Yes. Uh, so, um, traditionally, of course, creationists have split the thing where uh, Right. Uh, these have done. Uh, I have found a few creationists who have, who have raised the possibility of there being interspecies um, uh, crossbreeds. Uh, not very many of them. Most people will say, no, it has to be within the kind. Um, what I'd love to see is somebody take uh, some of these and see if we can get any kind of DNA out, the, out of them. Yeah, um, I think that would pretty much solve the problem right there. Uh, as we'll see in, a, in about uh, two weeks, uh, there's actually a possibility of being able to answer that question more or less definitively. And can, I think it would be fascinating to do so. Can you get Good enough DNA? You lose some mitochondrial DNA, I take it. Well, you probably could get a mitochondrial DNA at can, least. Can you and get there's, a, there's another point, too. Remember that they were able to get good enough DNA from Canaanite stuff from around Sidon. Five Canaanite burials. They went into some of the deeper bones, and they were actually able to get DNA out of it. Um, enough to where they they actually had some Y chromosome DNA, which means you're being pretty specific. These are autosomes and not mitochondria, mm -hmm. or not autosomes, but well, some of it's autosomes, some of it's um, you know X and Y chromosomes. Mm -hmm. That means that it can be done. It's only three thousand years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at something that's what four and a half, maybe five, maybe six thousand years. It doesn't seem unreasonable that at least some of the time you could do DNA mm -hmm. on this. Nobody's done it because everybody knows it can't be there. Yeah. The, uh, I, I would just uh, add the picture that Wood put up there, you know, that, that one is, uh, uh, gives you a lot of room for different ideas. Uh, so it's probably good to keep our minds open on this one. Yeah, um, but I think that not only should we keep our minds open for uh, on it, but that we should look at what kinds of experiments we could do to help differentiate between a more likely uh, two-tree model versus a cross model versus uh, various other ways of doing it. And I think that uh, um, I think we're being given an opportunity to be creative about answering those kinds of questions. The morphology, the morphology is uh, mixed, of course, hobbless, you know, that's, that's what I, it's a garbage can. Uh, but the others uh, should match the DNA. Uh. Well, and as a matter of fact, depending on how good uh, the matching process is, you might find out that you can say that this part of Hobbelus is human, this part of Hobbelus is ape. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of anthropologists would agree with that, regardless of their. Uh, I know, but if we find out that we can separate everything into human and ape, then I think that we, I think that their thesis gains a lot of traction. Yes. There's an interesting report that I came across of a pair of tweezers that were found in a 
piece of coal that broke apart. This was found in Russia. And a researcher who presently is doing research on the chromosome analyses, he looked at those tweezers and said those are virtually identical with the tweezers that he's using in uh, his uh, chromosome analysis. And here is this artifact that was in a uh, block of coal. Well, um, like I say, you have, to, you have to be very, very careful about assuming that nothing that, that we do now could have been done by people ahead of us. Uh, and so, yeah, I have to, I have to say, uh, uh, you know, the, the finding the tweezers in, a, in, in coal is interesting enough, but I have, you know, read about various objects that have been found in coal. Um, and what happens is everybody kind of writes it off as, you know, these are creationist nuts and they're not really telling the truth and it's all a lie and so forth. Um, the advantage to some of these things, and carbon-14 is one, but, um, but genetic analysis is another, is that you don't have to believe me. You can go and do this in your own lab. Whereas if you're going to do, if you're going to find objects in coal, well, once you find one, uh, you know, it's there, but uh, you dig a lot of coal before you find it. Um, and uh, so it's, you can close your eyes to one artifact. You can close your eyes to 20 artifacts if you're given them one at a time. In fact, it looks like there are uh, American Indians or whatever, Native Americans, whatever the politically correct way of referring them to them is, um, that uh, have uh, been found that are, you know, well over seven feet tall. Seven feet, seven feet, eight inches, uh, reported repeatedly in, in uh, ancient America and uh, or people who are digging stuff up and in the papers in Ellen White's time. And she refers to it, you know, she doesn't say, I have been shown that there are these things. She says they're in the papers everywhere. They were. All of a sudden they like disappeared. Um, but I, uh, one of the things that I hope to be able to do is to uh, pull up some of that stuff from way back when and show that not so much that it's there and it proves, but to show that, in fact, it was entirely reasonable for a person who was reading the papers to say, ah, there's another one. Uh, but the problem with those is, again, that maybe you can find them, maybe you can't. If you have DNA in mitochondria that fits certain patterns, that's something you can go out and verify for yourself. You don't believe me, go out and find a few beetles and see if they don't fit the pattern. It's uncanny. Anyway, that's for fun mm -hmm. for two weeks from now. Uh, it's been fascinating. <coughs> I, uh, I'm having difficulty with applying what seems to be good quality population genetics to human ancestry. Uh, as we uh, look at a creation story, you had the ultimate founder effect. Yes. Unless there were some way to, in that very, very small group, to have hidden diversity genetically, that would be expressed later. Trying to develop that diversity from extremely small populations uh, would lead, a, I think, a straightforward, perhaps uninformed a genetic analysis to assume that we should have all gone extinct. Yes. Well, there, there are a couple of things. One that, of them that's is, really a, a, something I've struggled with for a while. Yeah. One, one of them is that we're assuming that, that when God created Adam, he created just a routine human. He may very well have created the perfect human, and it's entirely possible that he put in Adam and in Eve 
uh, genetic diversity. Uh, uh, one of the things that's fascinating is that there are four major human haplotypes that their um, uh, groups, uh, and I'm quoting this from uh, Engager, uh, there are actually five of them. Uh, uh, one of them can be a derivative from one of the other four, and in which case we may be looking at God deliberately designing diversity into our uh, human ancestors first. That's a fascinating idea, but isn't that saying God planned on sin? Well, it may be that God was planning on sin, but it may also be that God was planning on uh, humans to be diverse in a good sense, and that the that there are different kinds of of uh, diversity that would be allowable. One, um, one is flat out degeneration, but another one is deliberate variety. And maybe where we weren't all designed to be, um, if you're Aryan, blonde, and blue-eyed, if you're, uh, uh, we weren't all, you know, just kind of probably average uh, skin tone and average, uh, which would be, I guess, pretty close to uh, uh, American Indian kind of thing. I'd say what I, what I just said, or these are kind of questions you pick up when you talk with Adventist young people who are informed. Yeah, and, I, would be, uh, I would be interested to see if we can, if we can fit everything into four major haplotypes and degeneration therefrom. Of course, and of course, in, in humans, we should be able to do one, uh, pardon me, in Y chromosomes, we should be able to do one human haplotype and degeneration therefrom. And some of the articles that are coming out are strongly suggesting that that's what we're seeing. Yeah, well, this problem, at least in my mind, is no greater than the diversity of organisms that seemed like must have been created that did not fit the yeah. original picture, such as uh, tremendous uh, adaptations for carnivorous living and uh, yeah. destroying everything around you, et cetera. So uh, I don't want to express, I don't want to sound like I don't believe in it, but there are really difficult questions to be answered. There are. And if we could find a pool of diversity that was waiting to be expressed, that would be wonderful. One of the things that is interesting is that it appears that mitochondria in various animals did start out with diversity, but that each species did not have much diversity. Uh, I'm borrowing from two weeks from today, so I urge you to come as I value your comments on it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, is there somebody else that's missing? Oh, are you Roth? Sure. Go ahead. There was uh, something that happened at the Tower of Babel, and there may have been some chromosome manipulations because all of a sudden you've got different ethnic groups that suddenly spoke different languages all of a sudden, and they uh, separated off and went their various ways because they were able to communicate with each other, but they couldn't communicate with anybody else at the Tower of Babel, that number one. Number two, my professor of biology at uh, La Sierra years and years ago was able to do some of his postgraduate studies down at the uh, LA Museum Natural History, and he was given special permission to go into their catacombs, which is hidden away from the public, and he had to sign a form that indicated he would be quiet on what he found down there. As, and he's, in, our, in our class, he mentioned one time that he was surprised when he got down there that here were all these large, large bones and from tall individuals that were hidden there Purposely, human so that yes, there were human human bones from individuals that would be obviously very tall, that were hidden down there, and they had large bones from 
horses and other animals that were hidden down there. And their display up on the main floor shows a little tiny horse getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And they totally ignored these other, which they should have had a similar display showing these large horses getting smaller and smaller, but they totally had those hidden away in their basement. Well, you mean smaller and smaller as you go back down? Yeah. Well, actually, that's been known for camels for some time, that the camels got larger and larger and larger, and then suddenly they dropped down to what's modern size. Um, well, that's a possibility. The other thing is, my understanding is that larger animals float longer after they die. And uh, I think we have somebody who's done some research on that general subject mm -hmm. here. Uh, also of interest that amphibians don't float as long as reptiles, which don't float as long as birds and mammals, um, which uh, also has some interesting implications if you think about it. Uh, uh, this is actually published research, am I correct? Yes. Um, that amphibians don't float when they die as long as, uh, me, uh, as reptiles, which don't float as long when they die as birds and mammals. Which fits the fossil record. Yes, uh, and I think this was published in a, in a journal that you know something about. Well, I, I think I refer to it in my book also. <laughs> uh, the, 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 person, the person who's done the work uh, uh, it's not very far from us here, you know. Uh, comment uh, back here. Come and get it. <laughs> you, you have to be a little bit careful with that because in those experiments, I didn't have any uh, fossil Paleozoic. I didn't have any Paleozoic reptiles or amphibians. Right. So we don't know whether are, they acted like modern yeah, ones, which did. are anatomically quite different from our modern animals. So you know, we don't really know. Well, it is, I, I think it is fair to say it's suggestive. It, it, I agree with you. I don't think it's probative. And it, you have to be careful. Don't overstate your evidence. And I think that's one of the things that we should be doing is allowing the evidence to speak for itself as much as possible uh, and not trying to force it into something. And not, but, but it is fair, I think, to say that it's an observation and that, uh, you know, as a first pass, it does kind of fit with what you see. And the truth mm -hmm. of the matter is, I think also, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but that if you were to take vertebrates out of the picture, the fossil record, other than showing a movement from sea to land, really doesn't show a lot of evolutionary direction. Go ahead. Uh, the question of <coughs> if there could be um, potential diversity there that's not expressed. Uh, there's good evidence for that. Uh, and uh, my favorite evidence is dogs. You got all these, these several hundred varieties of dogs. And there, there's good evidence that dogs came from wolves. But these, these, all these varieties of dogs, from Chihuahuas to Great Danes, maybe a couple of hundred of those, have arisen in the last couple of centuries or so. That could not possibly be evolution. You, you can't have that kind of uh, information arising in, in two centuries. Mm -hmm. that, that, that potential had to all be there in the beginning, before people tried to breed dogs. It obviously was there for some reason and in some way. Uh, and there's, uh, there's other evidence of that type. I was just reading actually this morning um, about there are two varieties of cats n which have never had spots. N never do they show spots. But they cross those two and you have, end up with, some, with a cat that looks like an ocelot. And so uh, again, genetic potential that's there uh, and yet normally you don't see it. Well, I think there's another aspect to that too, to be fair. And that is that dachshunds in particular are clearly achondroplastic dwarfs. 
Yeah, there are they, some mutations, but most of the diversity in dogs are, are not yeah. mutations. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the diversity is in mutations, but on the other hand, dachshunds are not advanced dogs. They are degenerated dogs. <laughs> now, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, they're cute little dogs and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not disputing that, but what I am saying is that they, they are missing something that other dogs have. There's missing genetic information on them. And that's why they have the little bitty short legs and their, their jaws are just fine because they don't do well with forming bone from cartilage. That's what achondroplastic means. Yes, comment here. In 1991, when uh, my fourth graders and I were still getting the weekly reader, uh, the story came out about the Iceman. And they dated him in the days of Abraham, which when he talked about the Tower of Babel made me think, you know, that those two times weren't too far apart. No. So why do we need this huge jump from, and then National Geographic, which we know is, you know, very evolutionary, they came out with, with the pictures and how Italy and, and Austria were fighting over the body and who was gonna get to keep him. Uh, I was just doing a little reading on it. Now they have 3D imaging and, and they've changed his eye color from, from blue to brown. Uh, but the berries that he ate were still frozen in his stomach. The skin, I mean, he was, he's one of the best mummies that, that was not found in Egypt uh, because he was under a glacier and the glacier receded and hikers found his body. So he's preserved in a freezer and they've dated him by his tools, by his clothes, to be about 5,000 years old, which would be in the days of Abraham, correct? So well, actually, somewhere the days of Abraham would be about 1875 I, BC, so. Not too far. Not too far, not too far. So why do we need this big jump? If National Geographic is comfortable to, to put the article in, you know, that this man was in the Copper Age, I think, believe that they said he was in the Copper yeah. Age then why do we need this huge leap to try to connect? I, I don't know. It was just interesting for me to rethink that. You know, one of these days we should probably do one on the Iceman. Uh, and, and there are some, all kinds of interesting possibilities. Because he's been frozen, his DNA is probably mostly good. And we should be able to do some fascinating uh, uh, he's, he's a man, so he's a Y chromosome, and he has mitochondria, so we can uh, relate him to mitochondrial Eve, and it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how far off he is. Uh, there are some interesting experiments that could be done with that. Uh, comment back here. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. Yeah, I... Uh, one of the things that I think we need to do is rather than saying isn't that interesting is to ask what kinds of questions could be answered if we were to do some experimentation because I think that there are some questions that could be answered and I think that the more information we have the better model we're going to have of of uh, how humanity came to be. Uh, again, I just, it's, it's fascinating to see what's happening with barcode evolution. Comment there. So, do I understand those things have not been done to the guy? Um, if that's true, why not? Are scientists afraid of what they're going to have to find? The, there, which, well, which takes science totally out of it. There are, there are a couple of possibilities. One of them is that it has been done and nobody's saying much about it because they haven't figured out how it fits. They're, they're talking about HD images and 3D images as I'm scrolling through here. Uh, 
I don't see anything on, on DNA. I, I'm sure it's occurred to somebody. And I'm sure somebody has uh, done some of it. But why we haven't heard what it shows mm -hmm. is not clear. It, it would be you would torpedo their theory. Well, maybe that's it. <laughs> Maybe the, maybe they just don't have enough. Remember, people do this because they have money to do it. And that means they convinced somebody else to do it because most of the time, uh, laboratories don't have their own funds around sitting to slush fund to do whatever they want to. They actually have to apply for grants and stuff. So it's a pain in the neck thing. And it raises some interesting questions. Supposing that we have people who are creationists who are willing to fund this kind of stuff. Um, but the labs might not be willing to do it because they would lose their grants. But maybe, maybe other labs might be willing to do it? Who might get more grants because of it? You know, so uh, I don't see it. I see it if, if people aren't doing it. I see it as a marvelous opportunity. And I think that to the extent we can, we should step up. Um, and I realize that that's, you know, we is a rather broad we, but you know, if, if nobody else does it, by the time I'm 80, I'll be doing it. <laughs> so. Anyway. Come back next week for the conclusion. And um, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, next, uh, the week after next, we'll talk about uh, the evolution of barcodes.